All right, so um, we will pick back up with sensory alterations. That's chapter 49. So whenever we think about vision deficits in children, um, we're gonna see these individuals um, usually doing some sort of self-stimulation, such as body rocking. Um, they might sniff or smell because um, they've lost that vision, or they might hitch instead of crawl, okay? Uh, for deficits for adults with the visual impairments, might see some poor coordination, squinting, underreaching or overreaching for objects, impaired night vision, and accidental falls. Now when we go to hearing deficits, for children typically they're going to be frightened when unfamiliar people approach. They might not awaken by loud noise. Um, they may be slow or absent um, development of speech and they may have a greater response to movement than to sound. Now, as we talk about those older adults with hearing deficits, we're going to see more of those blank looks, decreased attention span, a lack of reaction to loud noises, increased volume of speech, so they're going to speak louder, uh, positioning of head towards sound, okay? Or they might smile or nod their head when someone speaks. They might cup their ear. Um, they may do a lot of lip reading. And oftentimes, adults will complain of ringing in the ears when they have hearing deficits. Now, when we talk about touch deficits, in children, they typically have an inability to perform developmental tasks that are related to grasping objects or drawing, okay? Um, they might have repeated injury from handling harmful objects. When we think about touch deficits in adults, we're typically going to see that clumsiness, maybe an overreaction or an underreaction, failure to respond when touched, uh, they may have a sensation of pins and needles, may experience numbness. Now, when we talk about smell deficit in children, um, typically the child has difficulty discriminating until they are six or seven years of age. Um, and they have difficulty discriminating those noxious odors. Now, for the deficit in adults, they might not react to a noxious or a strong odor. Um, they might have increased body odor. They may have a decreased sensitivity to others' odors, okay? Um, taste, so deficit in children, we think about an inability to tell whether food is salty or sweet, and they may ingest things that all would be considered strange tasting to us. Um, deficits in adults, we're gonna see a change in appetite. They may excessively use seasoning, uh, complaints about the taste of food and weight change. Now screenings. So an estimated 285 million people in the world are visually impaired. When we think of screenings, um, we want to make sure for rubella, syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea that we are screening uh, for all of those in women who are considering pregnancy. Okay, we want to make sure we're advocating adequate prenatal care to prevent premature birth. Now, administering eye prophylaxis in the form of uh, an erythromycin ointment approximately one hour after an infant's birth, that can help to prevent blindness. Um, periodic screenings of all children for congenital blindness and visual impairment caused by refractive errors and strabismus, those should um, be done periodically, okay? Now, the most common visual problem is a refractive error, such as nearsightedness, okay? To help an individual with hearing loss, we want to make sure that the problem is not impacted cerumen or earwax. Okay. With aging, the cerumen thickens and it builds up in the ear canal, and excessive cerumen occluding that ear canal causes conductive hearing loss. Okay. So if we instill a softening agent such as mineral oil in the ear canal and then we follow with a solution containing hydrogen peroxide and warm water, we can clean out that impacted cerumen. Okay. Um, real quick, communication methods. 
So we have um, what's called aphasia. And we have two types of aphasia. We have expressive aphasia and receptive aphasia. With expressive aphasia, um, the patients are not able to express what they want to express, to express how they feel. With receptive aphasia, the patient cannot comprehend or understand the words that they are receiving. Now, when our patient has aphasia, we want to make sure that we're listening to that patient. We want to provide sufficient time for him or her to communicate, okay? And aphasia is um, spelled A-P-H-A-S-I-A. Now, we don't want to shout. We do not want to speak loudly because hearing loss is not the problem for these individuals. If problems lay with comprehension, we want to use simple, short questions and facial gestures. Uh, we want to speak of familiar things. We want to ask questions that require simple yes-no answers if the problem is with speaking, okay, um, with expressing. Now, avoid patronizing and avoid childish phrases. Childish childish phrases with these um, groups of individuals. Now, patients with any type of artificial airway, we're going to want to use pictures, objects, word cards, um, offer a pad and pencil. We want to make sure that we're patient and we give that client time to write their message. Okay, so patients with hearing impairments, we want to make sure that we have the patient's attention, but we don't want to startle. We don't want to approach these patients from behind. We want to face the patient on the same level. Let's make sure we keep our hands away from our mouth. If a patient does wear a hearing aid, make sure it's in place. Make sure it's working. Okay? Do not shout. Avoid speaking while walking away or with our back turned. And make sure that for these that are hearing impaired that we're speaking slowly and articulating clearly. Okay, that is the end of chapter 49, Sensory Alterations.